Good morning and welcome to this week's programme in which we profile a woman who made history a century ago, Countess Constance Markovitz. She made history by being the first woman to be elected to the UK Parliament and by being the first woman to be a member of an Irish government. Constance Gore Booth, from a privileged ascendancy upbringing, became an Irish Socialist Republican. From the archives, the testimony of those who knew her and who witnessed this transformation. We hear from her family, her colleagues, her followers, some of them disciples even. Maura Comerford, Margaret Skinner, Sean McBride, Helena Maloney, Sidney Zira, Sheila Humphreys, Nora Connolly. Later this morning, this. I have found no evidence that she was a good Labour minister. More to come of her later, but let us begin with Aideen Gore Booth from Betty Purcell's documentary, talking here to Marion Fanukan about Constance's upbringing. Yeah, what sort of education would she have had? Well, I think she had a governess. I think they had a German governess. And w- w- she wouldn't have gone to formal schooling then? No, I don't think age. so. I don't think anybody who sort of was reared in a house like that, or very rarely did, mm-hmm. go to a school at that stage. My brother Angus said that he heard that she could play the piano and that she used to accompany her husband when he was singing Polish songs in the Vice Regal Lodge. Her niece, Aideen Gorbuth, was expert on the family history. She was considered very, very good looking. When I grew up first, I met an old Lord Weems and he told me that she and her sister Eva and my grandmother were the three best looking women he ever saw. Light of evening, Lissadell. Great windows opening to the south. Two girls in silk kimonos, both beautiful. One a gazelle. I know she went to the Slade in London. She had a terrible job to get to it because, you see, in those days it wasn't considered proper for a girl to go to an art school and she was 30. Before she was allowed to go for one hour, the chaperone, each day. Well, then she was considered so very promising she got off to Paris and that's where she met the Pole, who she subsequently married. Constance and her husband, Count Casimir Kas- Markovitch, came to stay with us on the return from the honeymoon. Dermot Coffey. They were both painters of considerable ability and had met in Paris where they were both working. Count Markovitch had a strong Polish nationalist feelings. They, they brought with them as a servant a little Polish Jew refugee who, who they called Yanko. Yanko did not stay with them for long but got in touch with some dealers and established himself in Dublin. They had brought him out of pure charity. Oh, indeed, her kind deeds were so much the pattern of her life that most of them went unrecorded. This is her friend, Madame Sidney Zira. This is a typical one which I learned off by chance. I stayed in her house in Rathmines for some months during the 1913 lockout, when she was working day and night collecting funds and serving meals in the food kitchen she had set up for the victimised workers in Liberty Hall. Her home then had become a sort of refugee camp for all who had got into trouble with the police came in there. One day as we sat in her upstairs drawing room her housekeeper announced that a man wished to see her on urgent business. His name was unknown to Madame but she went down to interview him and soon afterwards came racing up the stairs and drew me to the window to watch him going out and then very excitedly began to tell me this strange story. Many years before, a poor Jew who lived on the estate of Count Markovich in Poland had come to plead with Madame to get his son, who was a frail, delicate boy, out of Poland because he was of an age when he would have to serve in the Russian army, in which men of his faith at that time were cruelly treated. Madame explained to me that though she and her husband were only able to get the boy away from Poland by engaging him as a manservant, and although they had no way of employing him, They brought him with them to Ireland. He was a steady and industrious youth, and soon after one of his co-religionists living in Dublin gave him some employment. She hadn't seen him for years and had completely forgotten the incident, but the poor Jew hadn't forgotten, had remembered her kindness and had brought her a generous subscription for the men who are locked out in Dublin. Maura Comerford remembers her husband, Count Markovitz. I saw him very tall, very, I suppose, dignified figure. He he didn't go the whole way with her, you know, on drama of other things. I don't think he did. Mm. 
and and uh, he's a bit inclined to 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 stick to his class. Sean McBride remembers Constance Markovitz. She was always up and doing things. I think very lively and a lot of riding and fun. I think and. I think she had also had a canoe. I've seen photographs of it. That this is when she was fairly grown up. That she used to paddle around the bay. And uh, Madame Marfitch was always on the go, on on the move. Well, somebody right. told me that she was very impressionable, and was some um, political speech she had on a carriage step somewhere. I don't know who it was actually. She would never stay put for a very long time. Well, the wind counters then concentrated on forming the citizen army in the early days of the tsunami. But I think they thought she was foolish. And um, even though my father definitely had quite a different outlook, he um, never barred the doors on her. She was always welcome to come home. She came. And I think somebody asked, asked him, rather, when she was at the height of her activities, how he felt about her. And she, he said, she's just as dear to me as when we were children picking the daffodils together. She espoused feminism and the suffragette movement. I deplore the idea that women's role is not a companion or a friend, but a beauty, holding dominion by her careful manipulation of her sex and her good looks. It would be better for women to dress suitably in short skirts and strong boots, leave your jewels in the bank and buy a revolver. Don't trust your feminine charm and your capacity for getting on the soft side of men. But take up your responsibilities and be prepared to go on your own way, depending for safety on your own courage, your own truth, and your own common sense, and not on the problematic chivalry of the men you may meet on the way. The two brilliant classes of women who follow this higher ideal are suffragettes and the trades union or labor woman. In these lie the hope of the future. She had discovered that Ireland was her country and wished to work for it. Helena Maloney. She was entirely ignorant of Irish history and, as she told me afterwards, had been looking round for some years for activity in which she could take part. She sought the advice of Arthur Griffith. He advised her to join the Gaelic League. She did so, but she felt the need for something more active, more revolutionary. Owing to her ignorance of Irish history, she had not the faintest idea of the atmosphere that surrounded the hated castle and everyone connected with it. She was already a staunch feminist and she eagerly accepted her invitation to attend a committee meeting dealing with the forthcoming publication of Ban Heron. She came down one evening in an elaborate evening in an elaborate court gown having come direct from some castle function which she left early in order to attend this little, this important committee meeting. None of us knew her personally and I had no idea that she belonged to the castle lot or I might not have so light-heartedly sent her an invitation. At that time there was a good deal of social patronage being exercised by the Aberdeens and their influence was much resented by nationalists. Enin and Aaron did not like any of the castles set coming into our affairs. They asked each other, what does this countess want coming here? Coming to do a bit of Lady Aberdeen's propaganda, most likely. My reply was, if we find her insincere, we can soon get rid of her. She got a very cool reception, almost cutting. Sydney Zera was also at that meeting. It was a cold, wet night. And Madam, who had evidently come on from some social function, was looking very radiant and beautiful. I remember she had a diamond ornament in her hair, a fur cape thrown round her shoulders, and she was wearing a blue velvet dress with a short train. That was the fashion of that time. With a few words of apology to the committee, she walked over the open fire, took off her wet shoes, placed them to dry, and came over to the table to join in the discussion. As we were walking to the tram after the meeting, I told her that the train of her dress was dragging in the mud. And gathering it up, she explained that she was getting on use now to wearing such fashionable clothes. That function from which she had come was probably the very last occasion on which she moved in society where such clothes were worn. Her aim was to help organise the National Boy Scouts. She began by calling on a sympathetic schoolmaster, I think a man in Pierce Street School. I forget his name. He was sympathetic to her ideas. 
he got his name as being all right. We t talked about the subject in some of the boys' classes and made it sound attractive. Thus was started the National Boy Scouts, Fianna Erin. It took a couple of months to get that much done. We took a haul at 38 Camden Street. Madame Markovich paid the rent, 10 shillings a week. She had a cottage which she rented out in Sandyford at 2 shillings per week. The country was really wild around there. The cottage grounds were used for drilling the Fianna boys, who went there every weekend and slept in tents. Helena Maloney remembers that she was a disciplinarian. Oh, that was solely her work. She was the only among, one amongst our whole group that understood the use of arms, of a gun, a revolver. Because she, as a countrywoman, she was used to shooting herself. And she was very emphatic about the proper use of a gun. Our boys had a few small rifles, air guns, I think they were called at the time. And with those, she trained them how to hold them how to carry them, how to ground them. And she was very severe with any boy that would take to joking with them, as boys often did, you know, say, hands up, surrender or I fire. She was very, very severe on that. She said if they went on with that sort of joking about a serious thing like a gun, that they weren't fit to be in the Fianna at all or fit to be a soldier for Ireland. My first visit to Dublin and my first meeting with Madame Markievicz was at Christmas 1915. Margaret Skinner was Glasgow Irish and she was a member of the volunteers. I had brought some detonators over from Glasgow and delivered them to her at her home at Surrey House, Rathmines. Madame and I went up to the Dublin mountains next day after my arrival to try out the detonators and succeeded in blowing up an old wall. While on my visit to Madame, word had come from America that a shipload of arms and ammunition would arrive in Ireland on or near Easter Sunday. This news, I believe, determined the date of the rising. When I left Dublin, Madam promised she would let me know in good time when the rising would take place. I remember another time when I was there, she was drawing plans. A young Nora Connolly, daughter of James Connolly, was working in Liberty Hall. The um, street, she was copying this plan of the Dublin streets. There were he was doing one for each of the different places that were being hit to be held in 1916. They were for the commandants in each of their places. And she would pick them up too and do a bit and put it down according to his... She had a bit of time free. But I remember one day some English visitor came in and was sent into the room without being announced and Madame was in the midst of it, the drawing board on her knee and these... Uh, Evidently, the plan, anyone could see there were plans of the streets. So, um, in order to prevent any sort of comment or discussion on it, she, she said, uh, oh, she's, that's all right, she said, I'll put this down. She says it's just a housing scheme I'm, I'm doing for Mr Connolly. Her own role with the Irish Citizen Army during Easter week in 1916 was the most senior of any woman. There was a, um, I suppose it'd be a British military officer passing on a motorbike up the green and she let him have it with her Peter the painter and I remember her dancing in the field in the green and said oh Mr Mallon I got me man then I saw the British soldiers coming down Harcourt Street Margaret Skinner the Countess stood motionless waiting for them to come near she was a lieutenant in the Irish Citizen Army and in her uniform and black hat with great plumes looked the most impressive at length she raised her gun to her shoulder it was an automatic which she had converted into a rifle and took aim. The shots rang out and I saw the two officers leading the column drop to the streets. As the Countess was taking aim again, the soldiers, without firing a shot, turned and retreated in great confusion. Madame discovers 67 rifles and 15,000 rounds of ammunition. This had belonged, no doubt, to the training corps of the College of Surgeons and would have been used against us had we not reached the building first. On Wednesday, I did little dispatch riding and spent some time with Madame sniping from one of the semicircular windows in York Street. I could look across the tops of the trees, the British soldier on the roof of University Church. Reading of hundreds of thousands attacking one another in big wars and open battle, this exchange of shots between two buildings across a Dublin street may seem trivial, but to us there could be nothing greater. Every shot we fired was a declaration to the world 
that Ireland was demanding an independence. After the rising, she was court-martialed and condemned to death. That they were very worried. Aideen Gore Booth recalls her family's reaction. I mean, I know my parents were very, very worried when she was condemned to death and they went everywhere to try and get it commuted. It was commuted. I was glad she was spared, but I knew that Madame would rather have died alongside those with whom she fought. Penal servitude. These words rang like a nail for one who was all energy, who always liked people around her, who was always engaged in some kind of work. Madam came there first. They put her to work at making the prison nightgowns. Nora Connolly. And underwear, which were made of heavy, unbleached calico. And the doctor decided for her woman who had had, after a while, the doctor decided the woman who had such an active life, sitting all day long sewing, wouldn't be good for her. So she had, she, they, she, they were told to give her more active work. They did. But the more active work they gave certainly wasn't one that pleased Madam for it. She was sent to the prison kitchens where our job was of scrubbing the floors and scrubbing the tables. Madam evidently had the urge to embroider also when she was in prison. And that from the rags she was given for cleaning, she selected those she thought suitable and washed them, washed them very carefully, kept the white pieces for embroidering, and from the coloured pieces, she drew out threads. Well, now you can imagine that job of drawing out of old rags, drawing out threads. And from the coloured threads, then she made, she did her embroidery. She'd get up an hour or so before the be uh, rising bell rang in the morning, and she did her embroidery there. And then she, when the bell rang and the prison officials would be coming around, she'd hide them away in some safe place. Dearest old darling. And from jail, she wrote to her sister, Eva Gorbuth. The one thing I've gained by my exile is the privilege of writing a letter. But there's very little to say, as I don't suppose that an essay on prison life would pass the censor, however interesting and amusing it might be. What you have called my misplaced sense of humour still remains to me, and I'm quite well and cheerful. I saw myself for the first time for over three months the other day. In prison, she had got access to a mirror. It's quite amusing to meet yourself as a stranger. We bowed and grinned, and I thought my teeth very dirty and very much wanting a dentist. And I'd got very thin and very sunburnt. In six months, I shall not recognize myself at all. My memory of faces is so bad. I remember a fairy tale of a princess who banished mirrors when she began to grow old. I think it showed a great want of interest in life. The less I see my face, the more curious I grow about it, and I don't resent it growing old. It's queer and lonely here. There was so much life in Mount Joy. There were seagulls and pigeons, which I had quite tame. There were stop press cries, little boys splashing in the canal and singing Irish songs, shrill and discordant, but with such vigour. She was released from prison after 1916. Moira Comerford. She had a wonderful homecoming, and, and um, she was in Liberty Hall. And uh, <laughs> she had, I, I'm sure she had stopped in London. She had bought a lovely hat with a nostrich feather in it, you see. And she was wearing her old cardigan at the same time. And the first I saw her was on a sidecar with a jivey who looked just delighted with himself. And there was she with the ostrich feather and the caddy. But I do remember the, the time she was released. Sheila Humphreys. Mm -hmm. And we all went down. She, you, know, you have that photograph where she was sitting up in the car and we nearly went mad because she was released separately from the men. And the next thing, uh, we came up from Wexford for a day in Dublin and... Uh, I had made up my mind to to bring something mm -hmm. to the uh, to the Liberty Hall kitchen where they where they had food for the people after the big strike. They were still uh, running that kitchen, and there was Con Markovich ladling out I don't know what food of some kind, and she came over, and we uh, spoke to me, and we had a few words like that. And then I went home and I got a letter from her. And it was a thrill to me. But when my family found out, 
that I'd had a letter from Countess Mackinich. And my grandmother cried, to that evil woman bringing young girls to their destruction. Uh, just the, the bitterness after uh, af anyone who wasn't for you was against you. She stood in Dublin as an abstentionist candidate for Sinn Féin in the 1918 election. And I remember the first election campaign ever took part in. Sean McBride, 14 at the time. It was her election in 1918, I think, 1918 elections. She was standing for a constituency in Dublin, which I think would be about the equivalent of Dublin South Central. She made history by being the first woman to be elected to the Westminster Parliament. As an abstentionist, she gave her allegiance to the First Thawl, which met in Dublin in the Mansion House 21st of January 1919, just 100 years ago. Yeah, I knew she set up with the Department of Labour. She, she was first, and I think, the only Minister for Labour in the world at that time, that it was Women Minister for Labour. And she was very active in setting this up and establishing a relationship with the trade union movement. Stunting. Maura Comfort's view was that she was too interested in political stunts. She was a stunter. I don't think she was... I have found no evidence that she was a good Labour minister, really. But uh, it is true that Labour courts were invented, uh, were started at that time, and that there was a, an interchange of uh, people to do judge or justice, whatever you would like to call them, uh, between the ordinary Sinn Féin courts and I think probably the land courts and the labour courts. When you say that Madame Markovitch was stunting, what do you mean by stunting? Um, turning up here and there, wearing disguise, dressed up as an old woman with a basket, throwing it all away and getting up and making a speech. And, and uh, it was so effective. <coughs> Her constituency was the St. Patrick's Division and, and uh, uh, the police there were determined to... I have seen a circular, and whether it survives or not, a, a direction to all the barracks to have a, a cyclist ready and to send word immediately if the countess should appear in their area. And that they would at all times have a, a van and a, a whatever was necessary ready to go and catch her with no other duty in, in the castle. And uh, they did catch her. Uh, but, but that's what she was at. I, I call that stunting. And in the great divide on the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921, it was not a surprise when she opposed it in the Dáil. I rise today to oppose with all the force of my will, with all the force of my whole existence, this so-called treaty. First, I stand true to my principles as a Republican, and to my principles as one pledged to the teeth for freedom for Ireland. I stand on that first and foremost. While Ireland is not free, I remain a rebel, unconverted and unconvertible. There is no word strong enough for it. I am pledged as a rebel because I am pledged to the one thing, a free and independent republic. I know what I mean, a state run by the Irish people for the people. That means a government that looks after the rights of the people before the rights of property. My idea is the workers' republic for which Connolly died. She took the Republican side in the Civil War and disliked, according to Sheila Humphreys, much of the political debate between various Republican factions which followed their defeat in the Civil War. Actually, really, she used to be um, half in the, in the moon at lots of these meetings, you know. Really? Yes. In what sense? In that, that she thought all this kind of thing was an awful waste of time. She was a person that would like to get things done, mm -hmm. just like she went out in 1916, mm. get results. Mm. And I think she hated meetings, and she hated arguments, and she hated all the hair splitting we used to have all our lives. We spent our time hair splitting on principles that weren't principles at all. She was, indeed, half the time she used to be, she, you know, she was a great painter. And great, and she'd always, always managed to have some kind of paper and a pencil, and she'd be sketching either some of the members that were there, or, and uh, uh, as I say, 
when when we'd get into petty discussions, you could see Madam would let her thoughts go someplace else altogether. Mm -hmm. But Madam had a wonderfully wonderful um, way, way. But she didn't have to say anything. She only had to stand there, and the people would go mad because of what she was. And she did. She never she never paused, and she was very interested. She tried to get us all taught elocution. She did teach us herself, actually. She had classes because she wanted to, she was like that, she wanted to bring younger people on, you see, and we'd all say we couldn't speak and say, well, there's no such thing as you can't speak. You can speak, you, all you've got to do is to start and to have courage, because of course she, ha she had such courage. But, um, oh, she was, she, was she, she, she had a great command of language and then spoke very clearly and very nicely too. And next Sunday morning, we conclude this archives-based portrait of Constance Markovitz, her political activism after the Civil War. I remember her going out during the coal strike, out to the mountains and, and uh, getting turf and bringing it in herself. And I remember her carrying it up the high stairs. I was with her, I remember it well, to carrying up this bag of turf, hauling it up the high stairs into a little room where there was an old lady, you know. Deciding in 1926 to follow De Valera out of Sinn Féin and into his new party, Fianna Fáil. When we found that Madam, okay, Madam was going to, it nearly broke our heart because to, to lose Madam was, was something awful. And contradictory testimony about how she looked back on her life as she was dying in the summer of 1927. And then when my Aunt Constance was dying and they went to her my mother told me, this doesn't please Irish people, but my mother told me that um, poor Aunt Constance was very sad about her life and said if she'd had to lead it over again, she wouldn't have done what she did. Not at all, not for a moment did she regret any of it. Not for a single second. She would have, she would have done it all again the same way. This morning's programme was based on original programmes by Betty Purcell, Marion Finucane, Philip Rooney, Seamus Brannock, Francius Mokaniesa and myself. And the centenary of the first thole is tomorrow. More voices from the archives at the same time on Sunday morning next. Thank you for listening this morning and good morning. That programme was presented and produced by John Bowman. But we begin with Constance Gore Booth, born in Lissadell, County Sligo, to an ascendancy family in 1868, became a painter in Paris, married a Polish count, joined the Irish Citizen Army, one of the leaders in the Easter Rising, condemned to death, reprieved, and the first woman to be elected to Westminster as a Sinn Féin abstentionist in the 1918 election. We heard part one last week. After her opposition to the treaty and after the defeat in the Civil War, she became a Sinn Féin activist. She lived in my, my mother's house, yes. Mm -hmm. As a child, May Coughlin knew her, as she tells Marion Finucan in this interview. She came there out of jail, after I think it was after the Civil War, and uh, because she had no house of her own. Um, she had furniture stored someplace, but I don't know anything about that. Uh, it was a, a nationalist house. It was, it was always in, in the tan time. We were never raided in the tan time. It was a nationalist house, but we were raided after the Civil War. We, we, lo we all loved her. We all loved her. I think we loved her because she loved all of us. There were nine of us in the family, and she loved all of us. Did she, did she like children? Did she, like she, children? she loved children. She really loved children. She was happiest with children. Because there was the feeling that she had somehow or another deserted her daughter and that this was because she had no feeling for children at all. No, that is absolutely untrue, totally untrue. The thing of leaving her daughter with the, the child's grandmother was not, a, 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 she wasn't rejecting the child. It was just that she was in, in the political movement and she was going in and out of jail and things and uh, in and out of uh, 1916 and that and uh, the child didn't suffer at all by it the child had a wonderful time and was more suited to be to to the life she had in Sligo in this uh, ascendancy type house because they were all she was that kind of person and she I know she didn't hold it against her mother because she often visited her mother later on and uh, they weren't as close possibly as other mothers and daughters might be but there was no animosity. Now, how about how she dealt with, with you children, the Coughlin children? Oh, we, we had a wonderful time with her. We really had a wonderful time with her. 
she used to, t- she had this old Model T Ford that she loved. It was her heart's delight. And she would take us all out in it, out on picnics up the mountains. And uh, she used to always take her sketchbook with us and leave us r- running around the mountain. Whenever she'd be going anywhere in the old Ford, she would be, be playing it out in the garden. And she would just come to the top of the, the steps down to the garden. And she would just shout, children, children, come on, we're going out. And we would all file into the car. And she would take us off Grafton Street, anywhere she was going. Did she go into great elaborate preparations for these picnics? Oh, no. No, she would take us all again into Grafton Street, into Fuller's. It was always Fuller's. And she always bought a chocolate cake. Now, there'd be an awful lot of us in the car, but it was always the, cho- the Fuller's chocolate cake. And we would go up to the mountains with this and we would each get a piece of that. And that, and that, was, was, the that was the entire picnic, yes. <laughs> they, they had offices in Suffolk Street, which in vain had offices. But uh, if she were going there, she would always she'd just bring us to Woolworths, tumble us all out of the door, uh, say, go in now and have... I don't know whether she gave us a penny such happens. I don't remember that. But what we were to do in Woolworths, I don't remember. But we always enjoyed it. And then when she was finished in Sinn Féin offices in Suffolk Street or wherever, she'd come to the door of Woolworths and say, children, children, at the top of her voice. Well, she always spoke very loudly. And we'd all come running. We'd all get into the car. And nobody took any. Now, we didn't think it was any way odd. Did the, did the rest of the people around? Everybody thought it was very odd. <laughs> we, we drew an awful lot of attention wherever we went with her in this Model T. Is this because of her voice? Well, the whole, the whole thing was odd, having a whole lot of children in the back of this very old car. And she, she always drew attention to herself because she was very tall and didn't, uh, didn't dress absolutely... Um, not, I wasn't, not normally, but... Uh, conventionally. Conventionally. Mm-hmm. Mm. So she, she, we always drew a lot of attention to herself. When you say she didn't dress conventionally, how did she dress? Well, um, she, well, she always had the, the long, thick stockings and the big shoes, and she had a wraparound skirt always, a kind of a tweedy wraparound skirt and some kind of a jacket. And she, this, she used to use this wraparound skirt purposely, I think not. I may be making this up because the Model T was always breaking down, and mostly up in the mountains, but anyhow, it was always breaking down. And she used to do all the repairs herself. She had a, a Model T Ford book that she called her Bible, and she uh, prided herself on always being able to mend it, mend it the car. So uh, she would ra- uh, whip off the wraparound skirt and the long legs with the navy blue bloomers would um, be show and she would get in onto the car and these long legs would be sticking out onto the car. That drew a certain amount of attention too. Moira Comerford recalled her as a natural leader when she organised food for the poor of Dublin in Liberty Hall. She, she wouldn't have been labelling out the soup herself, you know. That when I went in, she'd have been bossing the place. And May Coughlin recalled her commitment to the poor. She was very, very conscious of the poor of Dublin, and she tried in every way to help them. She wanted to join them. She would. She actually went so far as to try and get a flat in one of those blocks of flats where the poor were in. That didn't work because they, they, she couldn't be accepted by the poor on their own level. You know, she was too different. And some of them loved her, some of them mocked her, of course. But... Uh, she, when she'd go along to them and she'd find them in purse, I have seen her carrying sacks of coal up on her back, up long st- uh, stairs, long st- uh, flights of stairs to poor people in, in these flats. She herself was an accomplished gardener, as the young May Coughlin, in whose parents' house the Countess was now living, remembered. She did, always did the garden, it was a very big garden, and she took control and uh, did it all. We used to steal her strawberries and raspberries and loganberries and she used to get very cross. But she used to give us... Um, I think it was penny a dozen for snails if we gathered them in the garden. And uh, she loved the garden. Now, her, ca- her car took up an awful lot of time. And uh, she taught herself Irish from a book. And uh, what else? Well, there was, it was always on the edge of politics. Anyhow, people were always coming and going. And, of course, there was Fianna Aaron. And uh, people always visiting her. And among her visitors was Eamon de Valera, then president of Sinn Féin marginalised by the defeat in the Civil War and keen to undo the treaty by political means. And uh, de Valera used to come and visit her, not very often. De Valera well appreciated that if he were to propose any change in Sinn Féin's attitude towards the Dáil, that her support for his proposal would be important. And he would always send a runner along beforehand because he didn't want any people around when he'd be coming. Everything had to be, everybody had to be cleared away. He was very conscious of his own importance. And of course, she called him the chief and she adored him. She really adored him. Not everybody in Sinn Féin did. De Valera was seen by some as a pragmatist or even a heretic. When De Valera, in other words, decided to leave Sinn Féin and start Fianna Fáil. Sheila Humphreys. Can you tell me what happened? And Was there a meeting or did oh, she...? Oh, yes, of course. We had two or three meetings as to whether 
we'd approve of the new suggestions. And uh, when we found that Madam, okay, Madam to... was going to, it nearly broke our heart. I think it surprised me a little bit, yes. Sean McBride was another who did not follow De Valera with his new departure. Uh, well, I disagreed with her on that. I remember discussing it with her. Uh, she felt that it was the only option in making to make progress. I didn't agree with her at the time. I was making, pushing forward and making progress and regaining some of the positions we'd lost in Civil War. De Valera was pragmatically realigning the losing side in the Civil War, realigning Sinn Féin, and he brought forward a motion that the party should stand as abstentionist candidates for the hated Leinster House Parliament. Those elected would refuse to take their seats, refuse to take the oath of allegiance to the king. And when Sinn Féin rejected this proposal, de Valera led his supporters into a new party, Fianna Fáil. May 1926. To, to lose Madam was, was something awful. As Sheila Humphreys argued, those remaining in Sinn Féin deeply regretted Markovitz joining de Valera's new party. But Fianna Fáil did well in the June 1927 election. Markovitz herself was elected. Then came the assassination of the Common Yale Justice Minister, Kevin O'Higgins. The government passed legislation which forced de Valera's hand. This new law ruled out abstentionist candidates contesting future elections. Those standing for the Dáil must take their seats, must take the oath. And so after the second election of September 1927, the Fianna Fáil DDs insisted they were taking the oath as, in their words, an empty formula. It was a charade, a mere form of words in which they did not believe. Well, the whole question um, remains unanswered, whether or not she would have taken the oath. Unanswered because by then she had died and never had to face that challenge. May Cochrane remembered talking to her about it. Can you remember any discussions on how she felt about taking the oath when, oh, when Dev decided very, to stop it? very, very distinctly I remember them. She, uh, she adored Dev Lear, as I say, but she, she was going to have great trouble in taking the, the oath. Uh, I know this disturbed her a lot and I know there was great discussion at the time she died that at least she wasn't uh, faced with this problem of having to decide to take the oath or part with de Valera, as I say, whom she adored. Mm. It would have been very difficult for her. Absolutely impossible, I say. Her death had come quickly. Well, of course, you know, you know that uh, there was a, a, a fuel strike shortly, I think, after that. And she had an old car that wasn't easy to drive, wasn't easy. And she took that car down to the nearest bog she could find and got it filled up with turf to bring back to people in Dublin that had no fires. And on the way back, it stopped. And she got out herself and tried to start, it cranked it up. And it backfired. And she broke her arm trying to do it. And I don't think she ever really recovered after that. I never remember her at a meeting or anything mm. after the time she broke her arm, going down for fuel for the people who had none. She died in Sir Patrick Dunn's hospital in Dublin on the 15th of July 1927, just five days after Kevin O'Higgins' assassination. Kevin O'Higgins had been shot and somebody resentful of that had said things to her. This is Maura Comerford again. But then it's, that's contradicted and said she got very, very kind treatment there before she died. Madam Sidney Zira remembers her funeral. Among the mourners was an old priest who, appearing to be quite overcome with grief, was weeping as he prayed. One of Madam's friends spoke to him afterwards, and having asked him had he known her very well, heard this strange story. I've not seen her for a great many years, he said, not since I was the chaplain in Kilmainham Prison in 1916, and she was a prisoner there under a sentence of death. She was not then a Catholic, he added, but she asked me to walk with her and pray for her as she went to her execution. Thank God she was reprieved. He paused for a moment and then he said, I came here to redeem the promise I made her and walk with her and pray for her at the last. And then when my Aunt Constance was dying and they went to her... Her niece, Aideen Gorbuth. My mother told me, this doesn't please Irish people, but my mother told me that... Um, Poor Aunt Constance was very sad about her life and said if she'd had to lead it over again, she wouldn't have done what she did. 
she didn't think and she thought if she had a life like young people have nowadays and can develop their talents and do all different things like women can you know um she wouldn't have done it she didn't think but then that doesn't please people at all you know and it didn't please May Cochlam, who took a different view. Would you say there was any truth in the possibility that at the end of her days, um, she regretted her whole involvement in 1916 and politics and in and out of prison? Not at all. Not for a moment did she regret any of it. Not for a single second. She would have, she would have done it all again the same way. You're quite sure of that? I am quite certain. Constance Gore Booth was born the 4th of February 1868 and died as Constance Markovitz, 15th of July 1927.